JavaScript with modern React, i.e. hooks, lazy, and context. So what we're going to go through in this course, first of all, is what is TypeScript and why to use it? What's wrong with using normal JavaScript? Why will people use TypeScript in the first place? I'm going to go through that in this course. Next, I'll go through tools and plugins that I use. So basically, the text editor that I use, all the plugins that I recommend using for the text editor to make the course a bit easier for you. Next, we'll go through adding TypeScript to a Create React App project. So this is going to be a really quick and simple way to add TypeScript to React. And then we're going to do it in a more complicated way. So we'll basically have a project from scratch, no code whatsoever. We'll use Webpack to bundle and Babel to transpile our TypeScript code into regular JavaScript. We're then going to do a project. So we'll create a simple to-do list in React and TypeScript. This will introduce us to hooks and just the basic project setup. And then we'll do an even more complicated project, which is a Rick and Morty favorite episodes picker, which is going to introduce us to React context, suspense, lazy, we're essentially going to try and recreate something called Redux with all the new tools that are in React 16.8 upwards. So without further ado, let's get started. So in this video, I'm going to go through the tools and plugins I use as a front-end developer. First and foremost, if you don't have Visual Studio Code already, I highly recommend it. It's such a good code editor with great plugins and you should definitely try it out if you haven't before. This is what my VS Code looks like, and as you can see, it already looks different from the standard Visual Studio Code setup. So I'm going to go through what plugins I have. To see all the plugins installed on Visual Studio Code, click on this button here, and you can expand it to get more information about each plugin. So first off, I'm going to say what theme I use, and it's a theme called Night Owl by a developer called Sarah Drasner. Now Sarah has specifically picked colors that make it easier on the eye to see and more accessible. And that's one of the reasons why I like using this color theme. I also use a plugin called Atom Keymap because I came from a text editor called Atom and I got used to their shortcuts. So this plugin helps me use the shortcuts from Atom on VS Code, which I find really helpful. Another tool I use is called Bookmark which helps me bookmark bits of code I regularly go back to. The bookmarks are stored in here, and I can double click on any bookmark that's saved to go back to the file and the exact line of the code that I want to see again. Bracket Pair Colorizer is a really useful plugin that colors different brackets based on their nesting. As you can see in this image, each bracket has a different color based on how deeply it's nested. This works also not just for round brackets, but for square and curly brackets. And it's specifically helpful in JavaScript when I'm nesting functions or objects. ES7 React Redux GraphQL React Native Snippets is also a really helpful plugin I use to help me quickly write React components. I'll show you very quickly in this example how easy it is to create a React functional component by just writing these three simple letters. But first, of course, I need to save the file. So I'm going to call it random.jsx. And as you can see, if I just write these simple letters, React functional component, it does all the work for me. I also use the command block a lot as well as the console log shortcut. Now, as you can see, the font for my text editor is different from the default font you get on VS Code, and that's because I've installed a custom one. This custom font is called Fire Code, which was inspired by the popular Fire Mono font used in the Firefox browser. What this does differently from Fire or Mono is add specific font styles for double brackets, equals, less than, greater than or equals to, and also the exclamation mark and equals. So I'll show you an example of that right now. If I were to write triple equals, 
as you can see, it's three lines instead of three equals. If I write not double equal, as you can see, it's three lines with a slash in front of it. This makes the code a lot more readable, especially when writing fat arrow functions in JavaScript. A bit like that. OK, another plugin I find incredibly helpful is the import cost plugin. And this helps me to see how big the imports I'm importing are, if that makes sense. This helps me to see whether it's worth using a certain plugin, for example, Lodash, if it's 70 kilobytes, or, like this example shows, importing just a module of Lodash, which, as you'll see, is just 2 kilobytes. Another plugin that I think is completely invaluable is Prettier, which is a, co a code formatter that I use all the time. It's probably one of the most popular code formatters used in front-end development, and its format settings are geared towards using TypeScript, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. And with that said, I think those are the main plugins that are needed as a front-end developer. Now I'm going to go through the shortcuts that I use a lot as a front-end developer. Please remember that I have Atom Keymap installed in my version of VS Code. So the shortcuts I use will not be the same as yours unless you have that plugin installed. A common shortcut that I use is Shift-Command-P on the Mac to get access to the command palette. This has things like word wrap, or if I want to change or add a color theme, I can do so here. Another shortcut I use is Control Option T to open the inbuilt terminal in Visual Studio Code. As you can see here, my terminal looks a bit different from yours in terms of format and color, and that's because I'm using a plugin on my terminal called ZSH, whereas by default on Macs, terminals come with something called Bash. Another shortcut I use is Control Option B to use Prettier to format my code. As you can see, it's made it a lot better and easier to read. To find a piece of text in the entire project, I use the shortcut Shift-Command-F. That opens the search here, which enables me to search in the whole project. I can also click on these three dots to open up more options, such as files to include and files to exclude. As I mentioned before, this is entirely optional. If you want to follow this course with your own text editor and your own plugins, please feel free to. Don't feel the need to copy exactly what I have. So, what is TypeScript and why should you use it? What's wrong with just writing regular JavaScript? Well, I'll start off by saying there's nothing wrong with writing regular JavaScript. Vanilla JS is absolutely fine and TypeScript is entirely optional, so don't feel bad or out of place for not being able to use it. Essentially, TypeScript is an open source programming language developed and maintained by Microsoft. So open source means anyone can view and edit the source code and it being developed by Microsoft is entirely up to you. If you like Microsoft or don't like them, it doesn't make a difference. I think it's a really cool programming language to use anyway. It's a superset of JavaScript so similar to what C++ is to C. Basically, it has all the features that normal JavaScript has and adds a few more extra ones to it. And it brings static typing to JavaScript. Now, this section is a bit more difficult to explain with we'll just be talking, so I'm going to jump to the TypeScript playground and explain the difference between what static typing is and dynamically typing is. As you can see, this is the TypeScript playground provided by Microsoft. This lets you type TypeScript into this box and it shows you the JavaScript output in this box. Now what I'm going to explain is why JavaScript by default is dynamically typed. So I'm not going to use this, instead I'm going to use the console in the Chrome Developer Tools. So I'm going to right click and go to inspect, then jump to the console and clear everything inside here. 
So first, let's create a variable called a, and we'll assign it to the number one. Now, by default, JavaScript will give this a type. And to see what that type is, we use a type of keyword. And you can see it's type number. So I didn't tell JavaScript, make this number. It did it automatically. It saw the value and signed it to a number. If I then were to change a to a string, and then check its type, you'll see JavaScript has automatically assigned it to a string. And that's basically what dynamic or loosely typing is. It's when the language assigns types to your variables without you doing anything. So let's go to TypeScript and see what difference that is to dynamic typing. So if, if I were to assign my variable a again to 1, and then give it a type of number. So basically, this is saying 1 can only be a number and nothing else. If I then come to here and make it a string, TypeScript will say, hang on a minute, you said this type is a number, and a number can't be a string. So as you can see already, this is a massive advantage of TypeScript, that it lets you add types to your code. This can solve a lot of issues that a developer has down the line if they go to code six months later and try to edit it, it will automatically say, hey, you can't do this because you've set this restraint in a long time ago. So this is a fairly simple example. Let's think of something a tiny bit more complicated. Let's write a function that adds two values together. So we're going to have two arguments, A and B. And all this does is, sorry, I spelled sum wrong. All this does is returns, re return, ah, oh, can't spell, A plus B. So this is all this does. Now, in regular JavaScript, you could probably get away with doing this. And it'll be fine. Because these two are numbers. You could probably do this. And it'll be fine, because JavaScript just figures that out, that this is a number as well. Even though it says it's a string, JavaScript will say it's a number. And you can probably even do this. And it doesn't give you an error, but it, it will return uh, not a number, which, as you can see, doesn't really tell you in normal JavaScript what's going on. But with TypeScript, I can even say this argument A has to be a number. This argument B, then it automatically makes these two invalid because this isn't a number, this is a string. This is also not a number. And I could make B also a number so that if I were to make this a string, whoops, ah, sorry, that will also be invalid. So as you can see, there's already type checking going on just by doing this. And I could take it one step further by saying whatever is returned has to also be a number. So if in the function I were to make this a string, that would be wrong because it's not returning a number. It's returning a string. So as you can see here already, this is doing a lot of checking for me. This will reduce the amount of tests I have to write in my code will make my code of overall more robust and will prevent a lot of errors. So back to our slides. TypeScript has 12 basic types. So you already saw me using number and um, string. A lot of these types, data types, are similar to normal JavaScript. So Boolean is true or false. An array is a bunch of values that are put into one variable. A lot of these you know already, null, undefined object. But new things are the ones in underline. So a tuple, an enum, any, void, never. These things are quite unique to, to TypeScript. And you're welcome to look at the documentation in this link to see exactly what they all mean. But I'm going to quickly go through a few of them that seem a bit out of place. So what is a tuple? Well, 
say you had an array of different types. So you had an array of a, a number and a string and another number. Now, in normal TypeScript, if, say, you wanted to give this array a type, what you could do is do something like this. So that would mean an array of numbers. But that's not correct, because you've got a number and a string and another number. And what a tuple does is allows you to, <coughs> sorry, allows you to have multiple types inside your array. So now I could have this as number string and number. And this makes this a valid type in TypeScript. Okay, now let's explain what an enum is. Now, if you're familiar with C, enums will be quite obvious to you, but they're not really common in JavaScript. So what an enum basically is, is something that gives a friendly name to a set of numeric values. So in this example, you've got this enum called outcome, and there's win, lose, or draw. So win is assigned to zero, lose is assigned to one, and draw is assigned to two. This is useful if you have state machines that have different values for different states. Any basically means anything goes. It's similar to normal JavaScript. If I were to jump back here and make this any, it would be correct all the time. <coughs> this is dynamic typing to any value, any, f any function, any variable you have in place. Void is a function that doesn't return anything. So say we have a function called check, and all that does is print a console log called check, that says check. That isn't returning anything. So that will have a type of void. And finally, never. Now I'm going to be completely honest and say I haven't used never before, so I'm not going to pretend I know what it is. But if you really want to find out what never does, you're welcome to once again look at the TypeScript documentation and read through it. But to be honest, we're not going to use it in this course, so there's no need to know what it is for now unless you really, really want to. Okay, as you saw in the TypeScript playground, TypeScript converts normal JavaScript the browser by default doesn't read TypeScript, so it has to compile all the time to normal JavaScript before the browser can read it. And that's basically it. That's a very simple overview of what TypeScript is and the benefits of it. Now, I could go into more detail, but for now, this is enough to get started with the course. I'm going to show you how to install TypeScript on a Create React App project. Create React App is Facebook's CI tool for quickly creating a React App, exactly what it says on the tin. Now before we can do any of this, please make sure you have Node.js installed on your machine. It's really simple to install, all that's needed is to download the latest version, and once it's done, follow the instructions that it gives. Now I've already installed it, so I'm not gonna go through this whole process, but if you haven't, please do so. Once you're done installing Node, to make sure you actually have it on your machine, open up a terminal and type the command node-v. You should have a version number show up. As you can see, I have a slightly older version of Node but it's not too big of a deal. It's also important to make sure you have NPM. This comes with Node, but it's always good to double check. Type the command npm-v, and you should also see a version number here. Now that this is done, let's install Create React App by typing in the command npmi to install create-react-app and hit enter. Now this will take some time, so I recommend you take a break, grab a coffee, or just stay here. This video will be sped up slightly. Okay, if you happen to see the same errors that I do in the terminal, please do nothing about it for now. We will get to it in a later part of the course. Now to create a project, type the command 
npx create hyphen react hyphen app and let's give our project a name let's call it my hyphen app hyphen ts now this installation process could take as long as five minutes so i highly recommend taking a break and coming back later okay once that's all complete you should get a list of commands telling you how to start the app build the app and test the app now mine says yarn because i have yarn installed on my machine but yours might say npm which is also fine so let's change directory into our new application and before we start let's actually install everything that typescript needs so first of all we'll type the command npm i typescript wrong spelling type script to install typescript but before we hit enter let's also download the types for node react and react dom now i'll explain what these are later in the course but of course the first thing is this TypeScript, which is necessary. The types for Node are the TypeScript definitions for Node, and the same for React and React DOM. Now, these types or type definition files are custom types that the guys at React have created and React DOM for their components. And also, they've made custom types available for us to use when we write our code. This will also take some time to install. So I recommend taking another break until everything's finished. Okay, that's all finished. One thing I forgot to do before installing that was opening the folder. So I'll do that now. Click on the big open folder button, which is purple on my version of VS Code. And navigate to your user. And let's find the folder we just created which is my app, my hyphen app hyphen ts. And this will open a new VS Code window. Now let's see if this actually worked. Let's open up, open up our source folder and let's create a TypeScript file. So in our app.js, rename app.js to app.tsx. And of course, to run the file, open up our terminal. Let's run the command npm start. This should start the development server. And as you can see, it's detected by using TypeScript, so it's created a tsconfig JSON file for us, which contains all the specific configurations for a TypeScript file in a React project. Okay, my port is already being used, so I'm going to allow it to use another port by hitting enter. Now in your machine, it should already create a new tab for you in your selected browser, going to port 3000. But in my case, because I've already used a different port, it should go to 3001. And as you can see, the app loads fine. Now let's actually put some types in our code. Let's create a new method in app.tsx and call it sum. This method, as you might have seen before, will take two arguments, a and b. a will be a number, and b will also be a number, and this method will return a number. We'll return a plus b, and all these arguments are fulfilled. Now let's see the output in our code. Type this sum and let's put two numbers together, say 2 and 15. So we, if all went correctly, we should hopefully see the number 17 appear on our screen somewhere. Let's go back to our browser. As you can see, everything worked fine and the app is reading TypeScript.
you can see just how easy it was to install TypeScript on Create React App. Now in our next video, I'm going to show you how to install TypeScript on React from scratch using Webpack and Babel, which will be a lot more difficult. Now I'm going to show you how to install TypeScript on a React project using Webpack and Babel. Let's start by creating a directory. So make sure you've got your terminal open in VS Code or whatever terminal you want to use. Type the command mkdir to make a directory and let's call it React TS Webpack. Hit enter to create that directory and let's change into that directory. Okay, now let's install npm. So this is the Node package manager and it's what we're going to use to install all the packages we'll need. Let's initialize it with all, all the defaults. So that would be hyphen y, which kind of means yes to everything, all the questions it will ask you. But if we do it this way, we don't, it won't ask us any questions. But instead, it will install um, a package, sorry, it will add a package.json file with all these values inside it. So let's open this folder in Visual Studio Code or whatever text editor you want to use. Okay, mine's opened up over here. So I'm going to expand it over the other one. And as you can see, this package.json file has been created based on us saying yes to everything. So if you want, you can go ahead and fill in all these fields but it's not really necessary. Now let's go back into our terminal and create a folder called source, so SRC. Now I like to use the terminal to create files and folders because I think it's quicker, but if you want, you could use your text editor or ID of choice to manually click and make the files yourselves. So I'm going to make a directory called SRC. And inside that directory, I am going to create a file called index.tsx. So this is our index TypeScript file. Um, as you can see, it's in here. And this is, this is the base kind of file that all our React stuff will render to. And this is the base file that Webpack will use to get all its data from. So let's go back to our root directory. And let's add a few files. So let's add a file called index HTML uh, webpack configuration file and a Babel configuration file. So I'll explain what these three files are going to do. First of all, our index.html will be where our code's going to go. Webpack configuration file is where all our configuration for webpack will go. And similarly, all the settings we want for Babel will go in here. Babel is a plugin that we'll use to transpile all our JavaScript, sorry, all our TypeScript code into normal JavaScript. And this will also convert all our React code into readable JavaScript for the browser. Let's go into index.html and I'm going to put in the boilerplate code for a typical HTML file. In Visual Studio Code, there is a plugin that comes automatically called Emmet that has a few snippets for HTML and CSS already installed and all that's needed is to hit the tab key once you know the shortcut. So I'm going to use this to create a div with an ID of root app hyphen root. Okay, this is where all the React code will go into. All our JSX, our embedded HTML, whatever we want, will go into here once it's all compiled and ready to go. Now, one thing I'm going to add to our HTML file before we move on is a script tag with the source of bundle JS. This line will make sense a bit later, so just ignore it. Ignore the definition for now. I'll explain it later on. Let's also change the title of this document to TypeScript app. Okay, and we're pretty much done with this file. Let's jump to our index.tsx file and let's add the boilerplate for a React functional component. And we're going to import React DOM. 
let's not call it index, let's call it app. Um, I'm going to start typing in some TypeScript. So what this is going to return is something called a JSX element. As you can see over here, it's returning JSX. And this is a custom TypeScript type that is installed in the React types, which we'll install later on. But I explained this in the previous video when we were installing um, TypeScript with Create React App. So these are the custom types, the app type definition files. They provide custom types that we can use, and this is one of them. But as TypeScript, sorry, as that type hasn't been installed already, you'll get an error here in whenever ID use because it can't find it. So hopefully, once that's installed, this will be resolved. Okay, let's change these divs to h1 tags, and let's just put some generic text like "hello" to check the app is working. Let's grab the div tag we just created in our index.html file with the get element by ID. And let's assign that to a variable. And let's hook that up to our React DOM render method. So it knows where our React code should render to. So now everything inside app here is going to render to our root. So the React DOM render method is a method that takes two arguments, the React code and the HTML element or the React code should render to. OK, so that's all that's needed for this file. Let's move on to the Webpack config file, which is a lot of where the heavy lifting will go. First, let's write the word module exports and make it equal to an empty object. So what module exports does is essentially the same as writing the word export. But Webpack is read by Node. And currently, Node reads the majority of code that Node reads is JavaScript ES5. So that's an older version of JavaScript. And because of that, we can't use the word import or export. We'll have to do that in a different way. And we use require.js, which is a plugin that's installed on Node to import and export with syntax like this. Let's add a key called target. Tar target, can't spell, and make that web. Let's add a mode, call that development. And we'll add entry. And we will make that source index.tsx. Below this, let's add an output, another empty object with a key of path. For now, we'll make this null. And we'll have another key of file name. And that will be bundle.js. Now, I appreciate this is all quite odd to someone who's never used Webpack before. But I'll do my best to explain what all these keys are. So target is a target that we want to export our code to. So it could be web, it could be a native app, it could be anything really. Um, the mode is what mode it will be into development, production, testing. It compiles the code according to what mode it is. So if we have the mode develop, it will compile the React to develop code and production, it will compile it for production. Entry is the entry file that the main JavaScript will be in. And I've noticed I've made a spelling mistake here. There should be a dot, not a backslash. Um, so this is where most of the main JavaScript code will come in from. And the output is the name of the output, the name the Webpack should output, output the JavaScript file to. And this name corresponds to the name that we have in index.html. So once it's output, this file will read it and add the code accordingly to our app root ID. Just checking all that spelled correctly. OK, we're not quite done here yet. Let's add module. And for now, I will also make that null. Let's add resolve, which will have an object called extensions, this which will be an array 
of file types. So .ts for TypeScript, .tsx for TypeScript with JSX, sorry, TypeScript with, with XML. And just to be on the safe side, let's add a JS. So what this line does is basically omits the file types at the end of the file when we import something. So if I were to have an import of a file here, so I were to import app into something else, I wouldn't have to write index.tsx, I could just write index and the pack tell can tell that it's a TSX and takes care of everything accordingly. All right, one more thing to add before we go, and then that's a dev server, which would be an object that will have content base of just a dot and a forward slash, and add a port of 5,000. So what this takes care of is the Webpack dev server it will get the content from the root and it will export it all to port 5000. Now, this can be any port you want. Um, I've made it 5000 because it's the one that's least used in my experience. And what this does when it's running the dev server, it puts all the compiled code into memory, which is accessed by this file. So I hope that makes a lot of sense. Now let's address these nulls. At the top here, we're going to add a const variable called path. And we'll make that equal to require path. So this is how things are imported in ES5. In ES6, of course, you'd write the word import path from path. These two lines, one and two, are the exact same thing. It's just that this is the way it's written in JavaScript 5 with the required JS plugin, and this is the way it's written natively in ES6. Path is something that's supplied in Node.js already, and what we're going to use it for is to get the path of, our, of where we want the code to be exported to once it's been built. So in here, let's use our path. Let's use the resolve method from path. And we'll give it two arguments, which is which will be our directory name and the name we want to call the file, so build. Now, this name can be anything you want. It could be distribution. Um, I've just left it build because it's what I'm used to. But what this line does is once we've built our production-ready code, it's going to create a new folder in our root directory called build and put all the, exp all the compiled minified code into it. OK, now let's address this now. This will take a bit more time to sort out. It won't be as quick as the path one. Let's create a new const variable called rules. And we'll assign it to an empty array. This rules array will be an array of objects. Let's create our first one. Inside it, we'll put the key test, and we'll assign it to the value of backslash forward slash dot t sx and then another forward slash. So what we've just written now is called regex regular expression and it's a regular expression of all the files that end in this format. We're going to put the key exclude, another regular expression, which you can tell by these two slashes. Here, we're going to put node underscore modules. And one more key to add to this object is loader. And that will be Babel loader as a string. OK, so what we've just told Webpack to do is any file that has the keyword, sorry, any file that ends in TSX apart from the node modules file, use Babel loader to load it. OK, I hope that makes sense. Now, back to our modules, let's add an empty object 
with the word rules inside it. This essentially is like writing rules twice, but with new JavaScript syntax, you can just write rules once. So there are some ES6 features that Webpack can read, such as const and using one word instead of two for an object, but it doesn't read things like imports and exports, which I think might come in a future version of Node, but currently that's not inside the package. If you wanted Webpack to read your CSS and images, you would add rules for them here, similar to this one. But for now, we're not, we're not going to do that. All right, let's move on. Let's go to our Babel configuration file. And let's add an empty object with the word presets. As you notice, I've used double quotes here and single quotes here. And that's because the Babel RC is in the format called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And that requires the file to have double quotes instead of single quotes. Presets will be an array. And inside it, we're going to add a, a string called at Babel slash env. We're going to add another one called at Babel slash react. And a final one called at Babel slash type script. OK, these are the plugins we're going to need from Babel for it to compile our code. First, we'll need one for TypeScript, then for React, then the environment we want our code to be compiled to. Currently, I'll leave it as the defaults. But if you wanted it to be for specific browser versions, you'll do so by drilling down into this part and adding the necessary options in the code. OK, one more tweak before we start installing our packages. Let's go into our package.json file and change this test into start. We'll remove all the code here and write webpack hyphen dev hyphen server space dash dash open. And below that, we're going to write the word build. And we'll make that just the word webpack. So if we run the command npm start, this will just start our dev server and open a new tab in our browser. If we run the command npm run build, this will build Webpack for production and create our build folder as we described here. OK, I hope that makes sense. All that's needed is to install all the necessary plugins. Let's expand this so you can see what I'm going to write. And let's start from Babel first. So we're going to write the word npm i, npm install. And we're going to install first Babel core, which is the main part of Babel that's going to work. And then Babel preset env, Babel preset react, Babel preset TypeScript. OK, so those are the four things we need from Babel. Next, let's have a look at our Webpack and see what dependencies we need from that. So first of all, we need Webpack, the main part of it. We'll need the Webpack command line tools, which is how this bit is read, because these are command line commands. And without the CLI, it won't work. And then we're going to install the webpack dev server to get our development server running and our Babel loader just for webpack. And finally, let's get everything we need for React. So first, we need React itself, React-DOM, and then, of course, the type files. So types for React and the types for React DOM. And once you have all that written, hit the, hit the Enter key, and that should start the installation. OK, as you can see, I've made a mistake up here. I should have put Babel preset hyphen env. So I'm going to go up here and make that change. Let's 
Made another spelling mistake. I sort of babble wrong twice. It should be E-L and not L-E. So I'll change that at babble call and babble preset env. And again at TypeScript, I forgot to make that change. All right, everything's working now. Now, hopefully this should be a lot quicker to install than create React app. Sweet. Now let's see if everything actually works. Let's run the command npm start. And if all went well, we should have a new tab in our browser. All right, guys, I've noticed I've made another mistake here, full of mistakes today. Extensions with an S, not a T. Now let's try that again. So it looks like my 5,000 port is already being used. Let me... All right, it looks like my port 5,000 is already being used. I'll sort that out and come back to this terminal. So if you haven't made any spelling mistakes like I did, and your port 5000 is free, if you run the command npm start, fingers crossed, hopefully, it should open a new tab with your TypeScript app. Now for some reason our text that said hello isn't showing up. So let's go back into the code and see what's causing the error. For some reason, I spelled babble with an L-E, but it's actually spelled with an E-L. So let's go ahead and change that here in all three cases. Okay, and if you've made that change, and then run npm start, hopefully your code should work. Let's go to our browser, and there we have it. Our code is working fine. Now let's add some more TypeScript code. As we've done in the past, let's make a function called sum. And we'll assign it to a const variable. This function will take two attributes, a, an, a number, and b, another number. And this function will return a number. Perfect. Let's return a plus b, which should be a number. And with this fat arrow function syntax, we can get rid of these curly braces and this return keyword. So it will look like this. Let's put this function in our JSX with curly braces. And we'll put two numbers in to the function as attributes. Save. As you can see, Webpack will automatically update and refresh our code. Let's go back to our browser and as we can see it added both numbers up perfectly and it's running TypeScript without any errors inside our console. Of course if you were to then make this a string it would give us an error saying it should be a number. Okay guys and there you have it a TypeScript and React project built using Webpack and Babel this is probably the most complicated way of doing it, but as you can see, it works just as well as using Create React App. Okay, just as a quick aside video, if you're ever curious about how the creators of React built a at types file or um, a type definition file, if you're using VS Code, holding onto the option button on a Mac will allow you to click onto a custom element and it will go into our node modules types react. And you can see here how the content creators of React have crafted the specific type definitions for all the types that are needed in a React project. Now I'm not going to explain what all of this is, but this is just for the curious among us. If you do ever have to create a type definition file, you're welcome to do it this way, see how the experts have done it and borrow from them. And that's pretty much it. Let's move on to the rest of the course. All right, it's time to work on our first project. 
And as you can see, I'm continuing on from our Webpack Babel and React project. This is exactly how it was when we left off. Now, this terminal is taking up quite a bit of space. So what I'm going to do is close it while we code and only refer to it if there's an error in the console or in the browser. First, let's change this code here. Our to-do list is going to consist of a form with an input and whatever typed into the input is saved onto our to-do list once the user hits enter or hits a submit button. So let's create this form. Let's use React Fragment to encapsulate the whole form. And let's give it a title. So we give it a h1 tag. And we'll call it to do list. Very simple name. We're then going to have a form. And in the form, we're going to have two things an input of type text. And we'll make that required. We'll also have a button which is type submit by default, but let's add it to the code and we'll call it add to do. Perfect. Let's have a look at what these errors are. Okay, it looks like I forgot to close the input. So that should fix everything and let's get Preacher to do its job. And now it looks a lot better. We no longer need this sum function. We can get rid of that. And I will jump between my browser frequently to see what's being produced. So let's jump into Chrome. And this is a simple to-do list that we've just created. You'd have noticed that I use a shortcut to highlight similar terms. And it will bring multiple keyboards. The shortcut on Mac is Command D. Now, once again, bear in mind, I have the Atom key map tool. So if you have that tool as well installed on VS Code, the shortcut will be the same. If you don't, it will be something different. All right, as well as, as well as importing Fragment, let's import use state from React. And now let's create our first hook down here. Let's make a const variable. Let's call it value, add another value inside our array and we'll make it equal to use state with an empty string for an argument. Okay, let's explain what this is doing. I think the best way to see how use state works is to see its output in the JavaScript terminal. So let's add the keyword debugger here. And what that will do is when the code runs and it gets to this stage, it will break. So it will have a breakpoint and it will let you see whatever values are inside this part of the code. Let's jump to our browser, open Inspector Tools, and hit Refresh. And our code has hit the debugger part. So let's see what we have. For our use state, you'll see here that it returns both an empty string and a function. What we've done here in our const variable is that we've destructured the array and we've given the first value a variable called value and the second thing returned, which was a function, we've called it set value. So if you were to type in value here, it will equal this empty string. And if you were to type in set value here, it will equal this same function. And the way this use state hook works is whatever we assign here will be our default value. So by default, this value equals this empty string. If we wanted to change this default, we'd have to run this function and this value would equal something different. So let's try that now. Let's put set value into our code and change value to something like test. Okay, so value, which was originally empty string, we've now changed it to test. If I then were to write a console log here, 
of what value is before, sorry, after the change and before the change. Hopefully what the console should show is an empty string here, then the word test. Save that, remove the debugger keyword, go into your browser and refresh the page. So it's empty at first, and then it fills in with test and then keeps showing test. Now, as you can see, it keeps showing test over and over again. And that's because it's always looking for changes. We can amend that later on in the code, but for now, this is absolutely fine. Okay, let's get rid of this test code. And now you have an understanding of how this hook works. Let's give this hook a type. Use the lesser than and greater than signs just before the opening curly brace and put the word string. And that's it. Now, how does this work and how did I figure this out? Or well, I used the typed definition file. Let's have a look at what I mean. As you can see, the useState function has something called s next to it. And it has an attribute called initial state, which can, which can be this either this s or a function that returns this s. And then in return, this useState function has s and the dispatch set action function, which also has s inside it. So this less than and greater than sign in TypeScript is called a generic. And generics in a type definition file usually have a capital letter inside them. This basically stands for any type. This is a bit like um, a, a variable. Imagine the variable had any type in it. So this could either, either be a number, a string, a boolean, and it's saying the initial state is equal to whatever the user typed into here. So this initial, initial state could either be um, a string, if I type a string in here, or a function that returns a string. This single pipe here means, stands for an or in TypeScript. So this use state function with this argument of s with a colon means it returns an array of s and the function which takes in an s which imagine s stands for string then you basically put string all throughout just by writing string here it interprets s as a string so as you remember what i showed you inside the dev tools console is the use state function returns two things inside an array and it's the original value and the function to change the original value inside my code I've put a string here because the original value is a string. And simply by putting string in between a less than and greater than sign, TypeScript has read it as if the string that I put here is now s. So the attribute that goes inside here, the initial state, is now a string because I've put a string there. And this useState function returns a string and a function that takes in a string which is exactly what this does. And me doing that has taken care of all that type definition. Okay, now let's add a few more attributes to our input text over here. We'll add one called value, which will be the value over here. And we'll add an on change attribute, which will be a function that takes in e and will run this set value function up here. And it will take the attribute of e target value. Let's add another const function here called handle submit. And that's also, also take e as an argument and it will, first of all, prevent default. And then, well, spell that correctly. And then set the value of value to an empty string. Now, what prevent default does is when, when a form normally submits on, H, on HTML, it refreshes the page. And prevent default will prevent the page from refreshing. Now, as you can see, this bit is kind of underlined with this error. 
So let's see what we can do to fix this. Upon doing some research and looking through documents, I've found out that the, the type for E is actually react dot form event with a generic of HTML form element. Okay, there's an error here because I've spelled form wrong. It should be F O R M, not from. Now, as you can see, this is a bit long to type and I don't want to type it in each time I have a an E or an attribute with this exact same type. So what I'm going to do is make an alias for it and I'm going to call the alias form Ellen. So this is a bit similar to making a constant, sorry, a bit similar to making an, a variable in TypeScript but with types. So I can grab this, put it into here and then use form element and it's the exact same thing. Let's add an on submit to the form which will be this function over here and let's come back to our handle submit function and tell it to return a void because it's not returning anything so that's exactly the same as that's what a void is. And now if we save this page and go to our browser, refresh, hopefully it was refreshed automatically, but just to be on the safe side, we can refresh again. Type something in here, and if we click this button, it should wipe whatever's in here, because our function wipes set value to nothing, and set value displays here. So that's all working fine. Let's add another hook for our to-do values, add a const with uh, an array of to-dos and set to-dos here. Create another use state and we will give that an empty array. Okay, let's create our first TypeScript interface and that will be interface just below our form element. We'll call it I to do and then we'll make that an object with text, which will be a string, and complete, which will be a boolean. As you can see, we've got two different things here, a type and an interface. So what's the difference? Why couldn't we have just done type equals here? So what an interface does different to a type is a type references another type. So this form element is already this type over here. But an interface creates a completely new type. It's not referencing one that already exists. This is a completely new one. So if I were to have this here as a generic, you can see it's an interface of I to do, which is not referencing anything else that already exists, but a completely new type. If you look on the web, interfaces are written quite differently. Some, some people might have an I in front of it, and some people might just have to do. I've put an I here to stand for interface because it's a similar convention to other programming languages. But you don't have to do that. You can call it whatever you want. There's an error here because I to do is not an array. And this needs to be an array for this empty array argument to work. So let's change that simply by putting two square brackets here. So this use state has to be an array of this object. Hopefully that makes sense. Another benefit of having an interface over a type is you can extend interfaces and you can't extend types. So for example, if I had another to do, let's just call it to do two, and it's similar to the first to do, but with an extra with an extra key value pair. Tags, for example, which is an array of strings. If I wanted to borrow what's already in here and add it to, th to this to do, I can just write the word extends and extend it, similar to the way you can extend the class. You can't do that with types. Back to our code. Let's add a 
function to add a to-do to our to-do list. Create a const and call it add to-do. Make that equal a function. And this will take an argument of text, which will be a string. And we're going to have a constant inside our add to do function called new to do's. That will be of type i to do's to do array. And what this is going to do is going to make a new array, adding the new the new text to it. So let's grab what's already inside our to do's array, which is here. Should be empty at the moment. And we'll add a text of type text. Once again, this is the same as writing this, but, I've, but I'm writing it once. And we're going to say complete will be false. OK, so that will match this interface here, because it has a text and it has a complete. And finally, we're going to set our to-dos. So we're going to make our new to-dos variable here our new to do. And that's it. So so whatever argument that's typed into here will be added to our new to do's array. Let's add the add to do's function created, sorry, to do with no s. And let's put our value variable inside it. So let's run through this one more time. And type a value into here, and it sets that as the new value, which is displayed here. When we hit submit, it will run this handle submit function, which doesn't refresh the page, but gets the value inside here, which has been typed from here, adds it to our new to do's array, and thus making an array of all our to do lists. Makes sense? Let's console log our to do's variable. Jump to your browser and type something into the to do list. Currently, you see it's empty. It updates each time the state changes. If we hit add to do, we should have something new in our array, which is the text we typed and whether it's complete or not. And we can add more and more things to our array. And they should display in our state. Now let's actually show the user the to-dos that are added to the list. Create a section right below the form. And inside it, we're going to map our to-dos using the array map method. We're going to use both the to do, which is type i to do, and the index, which is type number, to loop over our to do's. I've made a slight mistake here. There should be two brackets instead of one set. And now this is going to return a div with just the to do text. And of course, because when you map something in React, it needs to have a unique key, I'm going to kind of cheat and use the index as the key. Okay, let's clean this up somewhat. Now let's jump to our browser and see that in action. All right, it looks like I made a mistake. I forgot to add the return keyword here as I'm returning JSX. So now if we jump back to our browser, it should display what's been typed in our to-dos. This ping was me testing, and I can get rid of that here. And everything should be fine. 
we can simplify the code a bit by getting rid of this return keyword and these two curly braces. We use prettier to format the page and that should still work as it did before. Now let's implement the complete feature. Let's create a, another function, a const function called complete to do. And we will make that take an attribute of, sorry, an argument of index, which would be a number. And then that will use our same method here to create a new to do's array. So let's create a const variable called new to do's. That'll be of type i to do array. That will equal, that will basically create a new array of only the to do's that have been completed. And this new to do's array will be equal to the old to do's. For now, just follow me and it'll make sense once I've finished coding. What we're going to do is we're going to grab the index of the new to do, so the number, and we will check if it's complete. If it is, then do the opposite. Then set that to the new to do's. Okay, one thing I've, I forgot to do in the add to do's and the complete to do function is to say what they return. And as they don't return anything, they're both going to be void. Perfect. So what this function does is when, when it runs with an input, sorry, with an index as the argument, it will toggle whatever the complete value is and set it to the new array. So if there's a complete value with a, sorry, if there's a to do item with a complete of true, when this function is run, it will keep the text the same and just change this bit to a false. Let's reflect that in our code. Inside our map section, let's add a button. So first let's encapsulate the whole thing in a fragment because React needs a an encapsulating element whenever there's map. We will move our key to our fragment at the top. And we will give each to do a button to toggle the to do's. We'll make this a type of button so that it doesn't conflict with the submit. And we'll have an on click attribute with a function inside it. And this function will run our complete to do function with the index that's typed into here. Sorry, not typed in, the index that's looped over. Okay, there seems to be an error. That's because I forgot to close this button. Now let's give the button some text. Let's say if to do complete is true, we will say the text should be incomplete. And if it's false, we'll say it should be complete. Okay, let's close this button format the code with prettier. And this is the way that React does spaces in JSX. So this is absolutely fine to have in your code. Let's see if all this worked. Let's add something to our list. Complete it. And it didn't seem to do anything. Now let's have a look at where we went wrong. It looks like I made an error in our complete to do's function on this line. 
So currently what this is doing is linking our old to-dos to new to-dos. So essentially we are mutating our old to-dos and sending it back to to-dos here. This is not what I want. I want to create a clone of our old to-dos, make the changes and set it to our new to-dos. Similar to the way this works. To do that, let's make amendments to our code. Let's add an empty array here and put three dots to symbolize the spread operator. We can remove our console log because we no longer need it. Hit save, jump back to the browser, type something in and it should work. Fantastic. Now let's add some style to our code to let the user know whether it's complete or incomplete. Add an attribute here called style with two curly brackets. Put the word text decoration in camel case. And we're going to use a ternary operator to determine what the style should be. So put to do complete here. And if to do complete is true, we want the text decoration to have a line through. And if it's false, we want to have an empty string. Let's see if that works. Type something into here, click complete, and there we have it. A line through. Now there's one more piece of functionality I want to add to our to-do list before we complete the project. And it's basically the ability to remove a to-do. So say I had a few to-dos here, and I wanted to remove a few. I'm thinking essentially of having a button here, clicking it, and getting rid of it. So there'll be a button, and it will be more or less similar to this. What I'm going to do is give you the time to figure out how that will work. I encourage you to pause the video, try it yourself, and then come back. Good luck. Welcome back. Let's go through the solution. So I'm going to create a function called remove to do, which will be similar to what we have here. So it's going to take in the index as a number and this will return a void, as in it won't return anything. I'm going to grab this because I will make an amendment to our current to-dos array, which will also need this because the mutation or amendment will need to go back to our old array. What should I do here? What method should I use to essentially tell the program to remove one to-do from our array? So I'm going to use an array splice method. I'm going to say new to do's dot splice. And what this is going to do is it's going to get the array that starts at this index, so it matches this index number, and then move and then remove the one that's next to that array. I hope that makes sense. For example, if we had an array like this. And we said we wanted to splice that array from number two, and we say one, that's just gonna remove number two, one space across. So that will leave the array like this. If we had it two and then two, that will remove both of these, and I'll just leave that. In fact, Let's see this in the browser console. Let's create an array, similar to the one I just showed you. And let's say we want to splice. Let's try the exact same example I gave you before. Two, one, okay. So it's telling us it's removed two. And now if we run array to see what it is, it's zero, one, and three. 
because it's gotten rid of the two. Let's say we wanted to get rid of zero and one and just leave three in this array. We can do splice again, starting at zero and moving to, so it's told us it's moved zero and one. And if we want to see the array now, it should just have three. Hopefully this makes more sense. Let's jump back to our code. Now this is complete, let's create a button that triggers the delete. Let's put another one here. Give it a type of button so it doesn't affect our submit. And we're going to give it um, a times symbol. Okay, I'm going to use prettier to format my code. Jump to the browser. One more thing I forgot to do was assign an on click attribute to the function we created. So that will be remove to do. And you want to pass the index to it. Perfect. Let's see if that worked. Let's jump to our browser, type something in type a few things in actually. So I can complete both of these, uncomplete them and delete them. Perfect. And that essentially concludes the first project. We have basically created this from scratch. We created a TypeScript Webpack and Babel config. We've, we've used hooks as state to store our to-dos and to store our value. We've used a type and an interface, and pretty much every single function we have has a return type. As you can see here. Now I could go ahead and add some returns to this function, the inline functions in our attributes, but I don't think that's really necessary. It's quite, so, it's quite obvious what they're going to return based on what we have over here. So this isn't that necessary. Okay, thank you for joining. And now let's move on to our next project. Hey guys, so in our next video, oh, hey guys, so in our next project, we're going to make use of something called context from React. Now I'm going to take the time in this video to quickly explain what that is and two ways to use it. We're going to use this platform called Code Sandbox to quickly whip up a Create React App project. As you saw in our previous video, it takes a while to set up and even install Create React App, and Code Sandbox makes it a bit easier. So because I've already created an account for this, I haven't set up with my GitHub account, I'm going to close this incognito window and show you what it looks like once you've created an account. All right, I'm going to create a quick React Sandbox and as you can see, it has a boilerplate for you and the layout looks a bit similar to VS Code. So before we start, I'm going to create a, another file called app.js. It looks a bit cramped at the moment. So what I'm gonna try and do is get rid of as many windows as we don't need. So I'm going to open app. So it stays here and I'm going to open index, keep it here and because of that, I don't need this anymore. So I'm going to hide that and it looks a bit bigger now. I'm going to reduce this size here and we can see more. Okay, so first off, we are, we are going to create some, a few function components. So first we're going to import re React from that. And we're going to create one called parent and one called child. So the way context works is it makes it easier for parents to pass data down to child components. So you can have a one parent component passing data down to a lot of children. But for this example, we're just gonna have one parent and one child. So what this parent is gonna do is have some text in here, um, random text. And what we want to do is pass this text down into this child component. 
So imagine if these two components were in different folders, imagine if we had multiple components. Context makes it easier for us to do that. So first, let's create a context. Um, we are going to use, we're going to call it store for now. And to create a context, you have to run react.createContext. Please have explanatory. Context returns two things. It returns a consumer and provider. And what we're going to do is use some um, object destructuring to import that into variables. So we have a provider variable and a consumer variable that basically is the same as the provider and the consumer provided by React Context. So now what we're going to do is we're going to return um, our provider in our component. And our provider is basically going to encapsulate our child. So we're going to get some props and use prop children so that if we encapsulate anything, it passes into here. You notice that if we save a file in code sandbox, it formats it with prettier. It's got different settings from what we're used to, but that's absolutely fine. It's giving us these green underlines because these are not currently used, but don't worry about that too much. Now we are going to pass a value property and that will have our text inside it. So this is what will be passed down. Anything that gets put into the value attribute will be passed down into whatever you want to pass it into. Okay, so this function is pretty much done. Sorry, this um, component. I'll export them both because we're going to need them at some point in our index file. And now let's create a child. So the child will return our consumer. You've probably got the picture now, but the provider provides the provides the data and the consumer consumes it. Okay, so we need to have a function inside our, inside our, inside our um, component here, which will basically take a argument of anything we want. In our case, I'm going to call it text. And that will display our text in any format you want. So this is the text that it's going to be passed into here. Okay. And that should be all the code we need. I'll save it to format it again to pass this data into here. So if you go into our index, we can now import our parent and child from our app file. And we don't need this anymore. We're going to make use of our parent and child by having a parent here and of course having our child inside it and as you can see our random text is passed from our parent to our child this is awesome now we can make this a bit simpler by using hooks so we're going to use the use reducer hook to eliminate our need for a consumer and eliminate our need to pass everything down as a callback function so the use hook needs to be inside the child. Sorry, the use context hook needs to be inside the child. We will call it hook. And we're going to use react, use context. Now we're gonna to need to change the way you've written this at the moment to, to have it not have it not destructure so that we can call the context on its own. So we can just change this to store. So we can pass all of this into here and we need to change this to store provider. And because of we're using the hook, we no longer need to have a consumer. So this should just be a general div for now. And we also don't need to have this random callback function. So we can get rid of that, get rid of this, sorry, get rid of that. Okay, and now you've guessed it, we're gonna pass our hook into here. And voila. So our hook has essentially got the data in value and it's displayed it here. Now this can be whatever you want. This can be an object. We can have that display something like text. 
and we can have hook.text and it should show the text here. We're going to make use of this technique a lot in our next video, so I highly recommend you go through this video again, make sure it makes sense, and in our next video you'll understand what's going on. Welcome back guys. In this video, we're going to create our second project, which will be a Rick and Morty episode picker. This project will be considerably more difficult than the previous one. We're not only going to make use of hooks, we're also going to make use of suspense and the context API. And we're essentially going to recreate something called Redux or recreate the Redux principles with the context API and hooks. Now, as you've noticed, I am continuing on from the Create React app project we did a while ago. So this is going to be the exact same file. As you can see, there's the exact same piece of TypeScript function here that sums two numbers. I highly encourage you to go through that project again and create a brand new Create React app project just for this one. But for the sake of time, I'm borrowing that because it's already set up with everything we need to get going. Let's jump to our code. Make sure, of course, your server's running and close the terminal. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this boilerplate code we have over here. As we are using hooks, we don't need to have a class component. So we can get rid of all of this. In fact, Let's get rid of the CSS and the logo as well because we're not going to use it. And create a basic React functional component. Inside our functional components, we're going to use React Fragment to populate the page with something very simple. A simple h1 tag with the name of our app. We'll give it a heading and a paragraph tag telling the user what to do. All right, this should automatically refresh our browser and we'll have this. Perfect. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to explain how Redux works and what its concepts are. I've created a picture and hosted it on the Medium servers, which I will share with you now. This essentially is a basic representation of what the Redux principles are. There are three main parts to that principle, and those are actions, reducers, and the store. You already know what a component is because we've created a few of those in this course. But this image is to show you how these three, three things interact with our component. In Redux, the Redux principles allows for only one store. There are other tools similar to Redux, like Flux and MobX, that allow for multiple stores. But, but Redux only has one store. So we're going to replicate that principle. The store is essentially a database, but for the front end. So all the information for the project is stored in memory somewhere and it's put in the store. An action is something that starts the manipulation of the store. So a component will trigger a function which starts an action. It could be something as simple like increment one this action will go into a reducer and look for what it has to do to the store. And then once it makes the amendment to the store, it will update the store and the component can read it. Now that wasn't the best explanation, but as I've always said, it's always best to see an action than for me to explain it to you. So what I'm going to do is continue on with the course, but return to this image every now and again, just to show you how the pattern is working in our code. So I'll go through this one more time before we continue. A component triggers an action, say increment code. The action has the code inside it to increment whatever numbers in the store. 
assuming we have a counter and it's set to number zero, the component will say increment number zero. This action will then tell the reducer and the, then the reducer will have the code to increment it to one. It will update the store and then the component can read it. The benefit of having an action is that it's, it's the best way for the component to communicate with the store if it's manipulating it in any way. As I mentioned before, the best explanation is to see it in action. So without further ado, let's get back to our code. Now let's create a basic representation of our store by first of all creating a file called store.tsx. One thing I forgot to do was set the return type of the app, which is obviously in a JSX element. Okay, let's go back to our store and we'll add a few basic things. We will import React and we'll create a const, a const variable called store and that will equal something called React create context. We will also create something called an initial state which will be an empty object for now. We will have a function called a reducer which if you can remember the diagram this is what the reducer will be. We'll leave it empty for now and we will finally have something called a state provider. So we'll create a function called, sorry, not a state provider, a store provider. And that will also be empty for now. We will export our store because it will be used by all the, app, all the components in our application and we will also export our store provider. What our store provider function will do is going to provide all our components in the app with access to the store. So let's return the store provider, the store, the provider part of the store that was created over here. Okay, and we are going to put inside it the props children. So anything that's inside a component will go through these two elements. A simple props here. And let's give it a type. So let's give this a return type of JSX element because that's what it's doing. And for now, we'll give this an any. We'll come back to the props and sort out what type it is. Finally, let's give this an attribute of value and we'll make something up. Let's just say, we'll put test in here. Actually, let's just make it a string instead of a object of a string. Okay, so our goal here is to make sure that this value gets passed down into any component that is passed through the store. Save this file and save this file. In our index.js, let's rename it to index.tsx to keep everything TypeScript. And let's import our store provider that we've just created from the store. What we're going to do is encapsulate our whole app in the store provider so that our app once again has access to the store that we're going to create. And to avoid confusion, let's get rid of the service worker part because we're not going to use it. Save. 
and let's jump back to our app TSX file and let's import store. Now let's give this store a variable of store and we're going to use the use context hook which we forgot to import. Actually we don't need to import because we've got the keyword react in front of it. You'll notice we've got the word react in front of a lot of the, these things here instead of importing fragment and use context like so and that's because down the line I'm going to move a bunch of this code and it's a lot easier to move it with the keyword react in front of it than to move it with um, the imported extra sections but it's make more sense later okay let's test if our data is coming through we are going to write a console log here of the store Actually, this should be encapsulated inside curly braces because it's JSX, not HTML. And let's go back to our browser. I forgot to change the webpack file. So let's go to our terminal and run the app again. Use whatever port it wants to use. Okay, it looks like we have an error because this part is asking for an initial value or a default value, and that's this bit over here. Let's move this above this, this export const and let's stick the initial state inside here as a default value. Now let's start adding some types. So as before, if I look into the type definition of, use, of create context, you will see that it also has a generic which is the default value and returns a context generic. So the generic is what's inside here and we haven't given this a state yet. So let's populate our initial state with some values. One is episodes. We will make that an empty array for now. And favorites, which will also be an empty array. Let's create an interface for this. And I will call it I state, which will have episodes. Pretty similar to what's over here, that will be type array. And this will also be favorite of type array. Array can also be written as a generic, like so, if anything goes inside here. But I'll just leave it as the standard array for now. OK. So let's assign this i state here. And we'll also assign i state as a generic inside here. Perfect. OK, as we can see, TypeScript is doing its job and has given us an error for our test because it's meant to be a type i state. Let's fix that really quickly. And instead of giving this a value of test, for now, let's just give it the initial state. So what we're expecting to see in our code is the fact that this initial state as a value has been passed into our app TX component through the store and it should console log what we have inside our initial state. Let's jump to our browser, check out our inspector tools and go to the console. As we can see, we have an object with our state inside it. And that's exactly what we wanted. Hi guys. So in our next project, we're going to make use of the use reducer hook. And I realized after I had recorded the project, I don't really do a good job of explaining what use reducer is. So we are back in code sandbox and we're going to run through how it works and the benefits of using it. Let's create a new react sandbox. And let's get rid of some boilerplate things that we don't need. So we'll get rid of the styles here. And we are first going to, we're first going to create a const variable. Actually, 
we don't need any of this stuff in here either but we'll leave it there for now we are going to create a const variable which will use use reducer and the use reducer hook takes in two arguments it takes in the the reducer hook which we haven't yet created and it takes in a default value now the way the reducer hook sorry the way the reducer argument works is in a similar way to the reduce uh, array function sorry array method and let, I'm going to show you how that works now so I'm going to use the console inside code sandbox I'm going to clear everything here and I'm just going to create a simple array okay and the reduce method array method takes two arguments as well it also takes a function and a default value so let's create that function now we're going to call it sum we'll have two arguments and it will return a plus b okay so that's created even though it's undefined don't worry about that and now we're going to use the array reduce method and it's going to take sum and our default value so before i hit enter what this is going to do is it's going to take the first two values in the array actually it's going to take the default value and the first value in the array and those will be our a and b arguments it will add them together return and then do it to the next one so it takes zero and one and then take one and two and then, then, then take two and three and it will add the previous value to the next value so if that's all correct we should have the number six so that's how reduce the reduce method works keep that in mind i'm gonna copy this and clear the console because we're going to use it later but i'm going to have it in a comment here because i might refer to it at some point so now let's create our reduce function or reduce variable which should be a reducer and currently that is not going to do much so it's going to take in two arguments state and action you can call this whatever you want but i'm just going to call it state and action for convention and it'll be an empty object and we're going to pass that into here okay this isn't yet complete because there's an error so let's finish this line so the use reducer hook returns an array of two things it returns array of the state which we're going to call count so an array of, of what the value is going to be and a function to change the value so it's very similar to our use hook um, i'll write it really quickly right now so if we had a const a quick test and we use the not use use hook sorry use state um, the use state returns an array with two things inside it and the array is the current value and the function that is going to be used to change that current value right and that should be react dot use state so we know how that works already in fact let me give this some more room it looks a bit squished i'm going to close this because i'm not going to use any more files and i've got some more room to see what is going on okay so as you can see these are underlined green because they're not being used and it's quite similar to the use state hook in the sense that this is our value this is our function to change this value so this dispatch function when it runs will run an action and the the argument that's passed in the dispatch function will be passed into here and it will affect whatever we have in here cool so let us first of all remove this because we we're not going to use it and remove this class name app we're going to create a simple counter so an increment decrement and the reset button and it will first of all have the count here which would be zero because that's the default value here and then we are going to have a button to increment which i call plus uh, but another button to decrement 
both decrement, which I will call minus, and another button to reset, which I will call reset. And this is giving us an error because React needs a, a, a parent div to have everything in. We are going to use React fragment, but we're going to use that in a, in a different way than we usually do. What we're going to do is just have a, a lesser than and greater than sign and a closing one, which is a shorthand for fragment. I'm going to save and it will format the code with prettier and it brings us back for some reason and forks the sandbox. I forgot it does that, but anyway. So we've got our buttons and our reset button and our state, which don't do anything at the moment. So let's, let's give these buttons some actions. We'll have an on click property here and we are going to say, all right, when you click, run this dispatch function and run it with the argument of add. Okay. So what this will do, you click it, it runs this dispatch function, comes here and pass it down into the reducer as an action. So we'll see it in action here. We'll do a console log and we're going to just print out the value of what's this just to see if it's working. Okay. And open up the console. If I click plus, it says add. So it's coming through. But as you notice, the zero has disappeared. And that is because this is not returning anything. So it needs to return something for the action to, for, sorry, for the value to, to be, be displayed. So we're going to return the state, which should be zero. So if I hit this one, it says add, which is perfect, but then it also returns the state. Okay. So what we want to do is say, if the action that comes in is add, then what I want you to do is return the state plus one. So whatever's in the state, just bring it back and add one to it. Press plus, it's running the add, and it's also adding them. Sorry, adding the default value. Simple enough. And we could do a similar thing for um, decrementing. We will call it add um, sub subtract. So add subtract, and if it is subtract, you probably get what's going on here. We have minus one. So add subtract, and if it's reset, it's going to hit our return state because we don't have an action for that. So we can create a quick action for that now. Click res for reset, and have another if. And we'll say the state will equal zero. So we can add, we can minus, and if you want to get back to zero, hit reset. So this is a very quick explanation of how the use reducer hook works. Um, it's similar to reduce because it's using this as a reduce and it's got default value at the beginning. Also quite similar to use state. Now, as you can see, this isn't the best way to write it, and we can write it in a few different ways. We can write all of this here as an object. So we can say, hey, we're going to create a constant object. And we're going to say, if it's add, state will equal, say, sorry, state will plus one, not 12. Um, if it is subtract, then it'll be state minus one, and if it's reset, then it'll be state will equal zero. Okay. And we pass that through by saying, return whatever the object's action is. Okay. So whatever's passed into the action, so it will read the action as the string, it will run this and return that. So I can do increment, I can do decrement, and I can reset. One problem with this is, for some reason, if we make a mistake here, and we come back to our code, we can increment, we can decrement, but we've got a mistake, and we hit reset, it wipes everything. And because we've written it this way, we can't have a, a return, like we did before, to return the state, whatever is written here. And this is quite, this can be quite annoying if you've got loads of actions and you've got loads of reducers and you cause this bug and you're looking around trying to figure out where it is, how, how did this bug happen? 
And to avoid this kind of issue, what is convention is we don't have an if else chain. We don't use an object, we use a switch case. So I'm gonna get rid of all this and I'm going to write a switch on the action. I don't know what does that. And we are going to do a case of add. So if section, that's not how you write a switch case in these curly braces. Okay, so if the action is add, then what we want to do is return the state plus one. You're getting the hang of it now. I'm sure you probably figure out what happens next. If it is re subtract. Then same thing here, but a minus one instead. And as you can see, this already looks a bit more condensed than our if chain. Finally, if we have a reset, we make state equal, whoops, we make state equal zero. And if it's none of the above, we have a default case which will return the state. Fantastic. So we can have increment, decrement, and reset. That's really zero, so it's a bad example. Reset, and if we happen to make a mistake here, like so, we can still increment, decrement, and reset, and it returns the state. In fact, we don't actually need this return because it's not being reached. <coughs> and there we have it. Now the beauty of this is it doesn't have to be a string, it can be whatever you want. In fact, I could say, let's return an object, which is what we're gonna do on our next project. So we can have one called type, which we add, and we have something else in our object. Something like a payload, which can be anything we want. I don't actually know why I've written that, but it's just to show that we can pass objects into our dispatch as well, and we can say, okay, if the action type, if the action type is is add, is sub, is res, then this should still work. Apart from this, which doesn't do anything because I haven't made it an object. So as you can see, this is a quick overview of the use reduce, sorry, use reducer hook and this is going to be used in the next project to replicate Redux and pass information around our components. I hope you found this useful. Let's go back to our store, minimize this terminal by pressing close, not the chevron, and let's add some details to our reducer. Let's give it a switch of action type. My action seems like it's come out of nowhere, but what's actually meant to happen is it's meant to be an argument. So we'll put state and action here as two arguments. Um, I know I'm going quite quickly, but I, I will explain what all this is in a few minutes. But for now, just stick with me. Let's have a case of fetch data. At some point we're going to fetch the data for our episodes, for the Rick and Morty episode, so we're going to put that in place now. That'll be string, and what that is going to do is once it gets the episodes from the API, it's going to get the current state and just put the episodes in there as an action payload. Um, having a payload is quite is conventional to Redux, and then. The benefit of, of having a switch case is that we can have a default. I've noticed I've put, I've made a mistake here. Fetch data, not date. Let's add, add a default here. I think that's what it's asking for. And this will return state. Okay, it seems like I've made a mistake. Case doesn't need a colon. Let's get prettier to format the code. So TypeScript will give me some errors, say state has any, and so does action. And as you can see, reducer isn't exactly returning any type. 
So let's fix that for now. I think for the time being, state will always be I state. And this will always return an I state of some sort. So either it will return this or this with data inside it. Um, an action will be will always be an object which has a type and a payload. So let's create an interface for that now. Call it I action. And let's have a type which will always be a string and payload which can be anything for now. I think we'll change that later on. But let's just take this interface here. And that should fix this. I've noticed I've done a lot of spaces after the semicolon. I mean after the colon, but it's not meant to have a space. Reformat the refactor the code. Oh maybe it is. Um save and this is that for now. Okay, so I did say I will explain this later, and um, I know I went quite fast, so I'm going to take the time to pause and go through what I've just coded right now. Let's refer to our diagram and see how that matches up to the code we've written. So this is our store. This is The store currently has an initial state of episodes and favorites, and this is where all the data will go. The app will get data from here. And that's what's reflected here. So the component will get data from the store. And currently, this is the only data we're passing to the component at the moment. Our reducer is what we're going to use to change the store. So if so, currently, we just have one action um, in our reducer. And what this action will do is once it gets data from the API, um, it will populate the store with the new data from the API, thus giving the component access to use this data. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and the action which we haven't created yet is going to be linked up to this. So once we create an action, we're going to link it up to the type, action type, which is here. And then it will figure out, okay, this is the action I want. I'm going to run this part of the reducer update the store and give that new data to the component. All right, let's see that in action. Let's create this API endpoint and hopefully it will make a bit more sense, but I'll run through it again, just in case it seems confusing. In order to create our first action, we need to give it the ability to be able to dispatch an action to the reducer. So basically we need to pass our component some some attributes, some methods that can give it the ability to change, to hit this reducer from this file. So this file needs to communicate to that file, file somehow to affect the reducer. And what we're going to do is use the use reducer hook that comes with React. So we're going to create two constants inside our store provider function, um, destructured from an array. One will be called states and one will be called dispatch. Now, of course, you can call these two constants whatever you want, but for now, I'm going to call it store and dispatch. Um, yeah, and we'll use a React use reducer. And what we're going to do is take our reducer here as an argument, and we'll also take our initial state as the second argument. All right. Now we are going to then pass these two constants into our value so that our component has access to them. So I'm going to copy them here and replace it with initial state. And there needs to be a second curly brace because we are passing in an object. For some reason, it doesn't look like it likes what's going on with state. So what we're going to do temporarily is add a conditional here and make it or any and that should temporarily fix this bug let's jump back to our app tsx and let's take our two variables state and dispatch cool this is no longer needed because we don't have a store variable and now let's start creating our action Let's create a function called fetch data action. 
and we are going to make it an async function because it's doing a fetch. So it's doing an API call. And we, we will be using async instead of promises because I believe they are easier to understand. And create a variable called data. And we're going to fetch a URL that we haven't yet put in place. I'll do that later. And once we get the data, we are going to convert it into JSON. So it's easier for us to read. And then we are going to return it, but using the dispatch so that we can send the data to our action, which would then send it to our reducer, which will then update our store. And the name of our action is fetch underscore data, if you remember correctly from our store and our reducer here. And our payload will be the data that we get from here. Okay, let's populate this and then see if that worked. Let's create a const of the URL. I've copied it into my clipboard. So I'll just paste it into a string and that will be our URL. And because I've used this, this endpoint already, I know the format is going to return. And I know that we have to do an underscore embed, embedded dot episodes. But you're welcome to look at the code inside your browser and see the data it brings back. But I've, or, or, but I've already done that, so I won't do that now. We're going to use a effect hook, a use effect hook, to get the data as soon as the user lands on the page. And that will be state episode. So if the episodes, if the user goes on the page and the episode's length of the state is equal to zero, so but basically there's nothing in the array, then what we're going to do is run this action and hopefully it'll populate the array. Now let's have a look if that actually worked. Let's add a console log here and we are going to put in our state. Okay, let's take the console log somewhere else. Let's place it right above the return. Save, refresh your browser. Um, make sure you're looking at the inspector tools when you do. Console and, okay, so that went a bit too fast. Let's refresh. Okay, so as we can see, it first loads with no data. It makes the call to the endpoint here and then populates the episodes array with all the episodes that we're going to display. I hope that makes sense. I'll go through it again. So. When the app loads, it checks if there's anything inside the array. By default, there's nothing. So then it runs this function. I'm using double ampersand, but I could use an if statement. I could use a ternary statement, but this is a lot cleaner. So it runs this, checks the, fetches the URL with, with an async, converts the data JSON to an object so we can use it, and then runs the dispatch function here so it basically returns this object to our reducer in our store. This object has got a type and a payload. So it matches the type here. So it says case type fetch data. If this were fetch data two or something else, it wouldn't work. The names have to be exactly the same. And then what it does is it gets the payload and sticks it onto the already existing initial state episodes. Thus, doing the reducer, action reducer, action. So this is firing that at the moment, runs the action, updates reducer and updates the store. And now what we're going to do next is populate the data from the store to our component. In our app.tsx file, let's get rid of this console log line and inside our fragment, let's add a new section. 
and we are going to populate the data with the we're going to populate our component here to show the data from the store so let's assuming we are getting data from the state let's get state episodes and because it's an array we can use the map method if I can type okay um, so this is essentially looping over each episode if you can remember what the episodes look like they look like this so we're going to loop over one of each one of these and we'll call one of these an episode we are going to return another section and that's going to have a key of episode ID um, that should be curly brackets um, let's go back to the Chrome console and as we can see each of our episodes has a unique ID so instead of using the index trick we're going to loop over each ID let's close this section and add an image from the episode so I'm, I know I'm going through quite quickly but I've Look through this API already, so I know it has an image, I know it has all this data, so I'm going to show this data in the code. Okay, an image tag with a source of episode, episode image medium, or you can have the original image if you like. I just think medium is easier to manage and have an alt tag of two back ticks and let's give it the name of the episode okay we are also going to have a div after we close this image tag below it showing the episode name so you can copy and paste this if you like Okay, and then we are going to have a section below it, if I can spell section, and that will have some details about the episode. So let's have a uh, season number, and the episode number. Now, you notice TypeScript is giving us an error because it doesn't want this to have an any. If we save this and our browser refreshes, it will show the error here again. So what it's essentially wanting us to do is create an, um, create an interface of all this data. So we can do that, but for now, let's just see if the data is showing up, so we'll make that an any. That needs to be in curly brackets for it to work okay and this should be showing our data as expected sometimes you might get a fail to fetch it just requires you to refresh the page and as you can see here it's showing our episodes with the names of the episodes and the season and the number okay so let's go ahead and uh, create our interface as that's quite an easy thing to fix let's create an interface here called I episode and we'll make that equal to an object now I know each episode has an ID of number but I'm not sure what else they have I know there's also a image and a name and a season and a number so let's do the name next, which I believe is a string. But to be honest, the best thing to do is to stick that console log back into the code. And we'll do the stakes as well. So we can actually see what the episodes looks like. Looks like Because I don't know what they're made up of off the top of my head. Okay, so you've got air date, air stamp, air time, that's a lot of stuff. So 
let's see if we can copy and paste this over into the interface and then just amend it from there. Fantastic. Okay, so I don't need this anymore. And then we can start making types from these. So this is definitely a string. This is also a string, but it, it looks like a date time stamp, but we'll leave it as a string for now. That's definitely a string. This is a number. Image is an object uh, medium, which is a string, and original, which is also a string. Pilot is definitely a string. And as you can see, it's pretty much simple to figure out what types they are after we've copied and pasted it in. Um, and the last two are definitely strings. Let's wrap the text around so I don't have to scroll left and right. Okay. As you can see, I haven't put semicolons, sorry, I haven't put commas after each line. These are optional as well. So now we've got this, we can have I episode here instead of our any, and that should be fine. Perfect. Now, as you can see, this looks like it could do with a bit of styling. I mean, it would be nice if the episodes were displayed in a grid format, and it would be also nice if the header stays at the top whenever we scrolled. So let's do that now. Let's go back to our code. And inside our index.tsx, we have a reference to an index.css file, which we haven't deleted for good reasons. Let's go to our index.css, and we don't actually need much of the code in here, but let's leave it for now. Let's get rid of this code block, and we're going to add some classes. One called episode layout, if I can spell again. Episode layout. Okay, leave that empty for now. Add another one called episode box. You notice I've got underlines here because I use a CSS linter. This is optional for the code, so don't worry too much if you don't have underlines in your VS code. We'll have a class called header, and we will leave that for now. Inside our episode layout, we're going to use Flexbox. with a flex wrap of wrap and minimum minimum width of 100 viewport height. So the width, the minimum width of the episode layout, which is spelled wrong up here, O-U-T, will be the height of the page. Episode box, so the box in each episode will have a padding of 0.5 REM. REM should be set in HTML. I believe it's set by default, but if it's not, let's just do it now. Uh, font size 14 pixels. So REM, to run REM would be 14 pixels because we set it up here. So 0.5 will be half of that, which is 7. Okay, and in our header, we are also going to use Flexbox. But we are going to have a uh, justify content of space between. So this is going to lay everything evenly across across a row. <coughs> We're going to have a background color of white. Um, even though it looks white, it's not white by default. And we're going to have a border at the bottom of our header which is correct. I like to use words instead of um, hexadecimals because they're easier to read. And we are going to have a padding, of course, of 0.5 REM. And we're going to have a position of sticky. Okay, we're going to have top zero because that's needed for position sticky. And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so let's start adding these classes. Actually, before I forget, the body should have a font size of 10, as well as that having fonts, as well as the HTML having a font size of 14. 
in our app.tsx file, let's add a class name to this section. We're going to add the episode layout class. inside our header which should be here let's add a header tag here and we are going to add a class to our header which would be called surprise surprise header and finally for each of our episodes we are going to add a class And that will be episode box. Let's see what changes they have made. And as you can see, this is aligned with flex. Our content is in a grid. And as we scroll down, it sticks to the top. Now, what we're going to do is add a button that enables users to click on it and select the favorite episode. So there's a button on this side. When the user clicks on it, it will toggle the favorites. So let's scroll down to our section that populates the grid. And we are going to add a button, say about here. So put the divs here. And right next to this, let's have a button. And this button will say fave. For favorites, this will be type button not because it's type submit by default and we are going to have an on click here so something will happen when you, when you click on it and this will run a function which we haven't created but we will call toggle favorites action and this will need the episode okay so this is given us an error because it doesn't exist Let's reformat the code with prettier and let's create this function. We don't need this anymore. And right below our fetch data action, we're going to create a toggle favorite action as a const as a as a const. Okay. And that will take in the episode we pass into it. So this is the whole episode object. And for now, what this is going to do, in fact, I don't actually need these curly braces because I'm going to return a dispatch by default. And what this is going to do is going to dispatch to uh, a reducer, a section in the reducer we haven't yet created called add favorites. And our payload will be, you've guessed it, the episode. Okay, once again, episode needs to type, and luckily for, for us, we've already created a type for episode, so we'll make use of that. Curly brackets, and episode type. We don't have a return type for this, so what we can do, our return type for this would be our, our action. But as you can see, <coughs> But as you can see, our actions is in a different, our interface, sorry, is in a different file from where we want it to be. And because we've created an interface, we can export this interface. And we can import it here along with the store. And now we can make use, use of that here. And we can make use of that here as well. Ah, because it's an async, we can't make use of it. We need to make a specific promise return. So I'll come back to this later. Okay, and that's all looking good. Let's go ahead and add this functionality to our reducer. Let's go to our store, find our reducer, and let's add another case. We will call it add favorite. And what this is going to do is it's going to return whatever is in our state 
whatever's currently in our state. And what we're going to do is amend the favorites section. So currently the favorites is empty. What we're going to do is add whatever is in our episode into our favorite. So we'll do that by creating an array, populating it with whatever is already in the state's favorite section. Have I spot that incorrectly? No, that looks correct. So we'll populate that with whatever's in the favorite section and we will take our payload. Okay, let's format that prettier and really, so this is going to add whatever's in our payload to our favorite section. Okay, so as you can see, this, this assumes that an empty array will have a length of zero. Um, what we're going to do is change that to an array generic with any inside it. Because I don't know how long it's going to be. I mean, how long the array is going to be in length. Let's also do. Let's also do that here. And in fact, let's see if that fixes this problem we had here. Perfect. So we've got rid of one any. Hopefully, by the, by the end of the course, I want to have no any's inside there. That's my plan. So we're going to populate all of this. And as you can probably already figure out, no, that still needs it. Let's put that back then. We'll figure that out later. Um, as you probably already figured out, this here episode will be an a array of I state type. So what we can do is we can export our I episodes um, and import that into here. However, ideally, it's probably best to have a folder just for interfaces. So we can create that really quickly now. Sorry, I meant a file, not a folder. So we'll call that interfaces.tsx. Um, and let's grab all our, all our interfaces and put them into one place. Take these two, put them in here, make them all exports. And we're going to grab the one we made here, which is already set to an export. Add a command block at the top to tell whoever's looking at it what this is. Okay, and so let's populate our app with the interfaces that we need. Okay, don't need it from here anymore. And that should fix that. We also need to do a similar thing in the store section. So we need one of our states. Um, and yep, we need a fire ac action as well. And I think that's it. What's the third problem we made? I episode. And that's, in fact, we could do something really clever here and add I episodes to this one as well, because it's needed in there. Okay, and I believe this one also needs an I episode, yep. Okay, it's looking good. Let's see if our new add to favorite case in the reducer has worked. So I hope you're getting the hang of this. There is an action that triggers the reducer and the reducer will update the store. Once again, we're going to add a control log here with our state. Is that what I called it? Yep, I called it state. And we're going to see if that works. Jump to our browser, we have a favorite button and let's inspect the elements. Okay, so we've got our episodes, nothing in our favorites. If I want to favorite episode three, click on that. And like clockwork, we have an episode in our favorites. Let's add the option to remove favorites, but this is gonna be quite tricky because we're going to, the same button that adds the favorite will also be the same one that reduces the favorite. So if we click once to add a new favorite, click again, to remove that episode. Currently, just it keeps adding the same episode over and over again. So we're going to fix this bug and add the option to remove favorites. In our toggle favorite action, we are going to give it a constant variable called episode. 
in fav. So this is going to check if our episode is in favorites part. As you can see, it's giving us an error because it's automatically returning the dispatch. Now, because we've added this constant, it can't actually read it. So we're going to make it a, a different function, not an automatically returning function, but a one that requires a return keyword. And we're going to return this. So this is essentially the same thing. This is giving us an error because it's not used. So let's use it by giving it, by making sure it checks if an episode is in our favorites object. This will make sense as I code. Okay. As you can see here, this is looking in our favorites array and checking if the episode that's passed into it exists. If it does, it will return true. If it doesn't, it will return false. Let's create a default dispatch, ob dispatch object. Um, variable. And that's going to basically, by default, do this. So I didn't actually need to write curly braces, but it's a thing I do by habit. And we're going to say, if this episode that's use that's called sorry if the episode attribute exists inside this array so if this is true then we are going to do something we are going to change our dispatch object to have a different have a different action which we haven't yet created called remove favorites and this here Actually, I should get dispatch object. So re the return will dispatch whatever object this is. So if this exists, then remove it. If it doesn't, then add it. Makes sense. OK, now you probably noticed this doesn't quite make sense, because what we're doing is if we are, if this episode doesn't exist, then we are removing it. But then we're also sending this episode to our to our reducer. So we're going to make a slight tweak here. We're going to add a constant variable which will be the favorites array but without the episode. So we're going to take this episode out of the favorites array and then give the new array to our payload. So it's going to populate, it's going to replace the old favorites array with this new one without the episode that's been favorited. And to do that, we're going to use the filter method. Favorite should be an S, because we're referring to the array in the state. And that the filter method removes an object if it complies to whatever we type into the attribute. So we have to put a callback function in and what we're going to do is say if the favorite ID, so if you loop every each favorite, if the favorite ID here does not equal the episode ID, episode ID, then remove it. So favorite doesn't seem to have a type because we haven't created an interface for it. But essentially, the favorite is the same as an episode because that's what's being passed into it. So it doesn't need to have any, because it already has a type. So what this is saying is, if the favorite ID that's here matches the episode ID, so it matches the episode ID that's here, then remove that from the filters array. So filter it out from this favorites array, sorry, not the filter array, and then return this new array to the payload. Make sense? Okay, so if we run our code, this wouldn't work because we haven't yet added this to our reducer. So let's do that now. You probably figured out how this is gonna work, so I'm gonna give you some time to write this in our code. And once you, I highly recommend you pause the video, give it a go. And once you've done that, come back and see if your answer matches the one I'm gonna type. Welcome back. You probably figured it out, but I'm just going to go through it anyway. 
So let's create this case, which will be called remove favorites. And all this is going to do is return the state that already exists. But for our favorites array, for some reason I can't spell, what we're going to do is replace this whole array with what's passed in our payload. Now, there are plenty of ways you can do this. In fact, if you wanted to, you could have just had this filter inside the reducer in the first place, and that will take care of all that stuff. But for me personally, this is the way I like to work. I like just to pass data into the reducer and then let the, redu let the reducer update the store that way. I'm not really a huge fan of having logic in my reducer, but everyone's different. Okay, and one more thing to do to indicate to the user that they have actually clicked on the favorite button is we're going to have a ternary and we're going to change this based on if the favorite episode exists inside the array or it doesn't. Once again, I recommend you pause this video and try to figure that out on your own. And then once you're done, come back and see if your solution matches mine or works. Welcome back. Let's amend this part of the code. I'm going to get rid of this favorite string. I'm going to add some curly braces and say that if in our states, in our favorites array, if see if you can find the favorite episode that matches, that has the matching ID of the one of the episode ID here that is loot. So I want to say, hey, if you can find an episode in the favorites, uh, an episode in the favorites array that matches the episode that's being looped here, what I want you to do is have the text unfave because it's going to remove the favorite. If you can't find it, have the text fave. Of course, fave needs a type. And we already have a type which is the same as episode. So we are going to do that here. Okay, format the code as usual. Save and jump to our browser. Okay, lucky for us, we have no errors. Let's see if that worked. Click fave, unfave, click unfave. Okay, so that part worked. Let's see if it shows inside our code. Jump back to our console, get rid of what's inside it, hit the fave. We have one in our array, which should be the lawnmower dog. And it is. And if we click that one again, our array is now empty because there are no favorites in the episode. Great. Now we don't want the user to be looking at the console each time. So let's see if we can display the favorite length up here somewhere so they can see how many episodes are in their favorites. This is quite straightforward. Um, and in in fact, I'm actually going to let you try and do it now. So once again, pause the video, give it a go, see if you can display favorite length on the page somewhere. And then once you're done, come back and we'll go through the solution together. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and add a length to our favorites array and display that to the user. So I'm going to split this up here into two separate divs, into one separate div, sorry, and add another div for the favorites array. Uh, display text, sorry, display flex will take care of the layout, so I'm not going to bother too much about that. Let's have a string here called favorites, and let's display states.favorites. Struggling to spell for some reason today, and all we need to do is then display the length. So now if we go into our code, this is our favorites with zero. And then you can add, once my scroll bar disappears, if it ever disappears, you can see a one in the background somewhere, okay. Add as many favorites as we want, and then we can remove those same favorites and it should reduce the number. Great. Now we're going to figure out how to create a page for the user to visit the favorite episode, and also jump back to the home page and see what episodes they can add to the favorite list. In our last video, we created this page with our favorite and unfavorite button, which has the length of our favorites. What we're going to do now is create two separate pages, one 
for the home page, essentially this page, and another one to display the favorite episodes. What we're going to do first is kind of split this up as, as this is going to be used in two different pages. We want to make this a reusable component. So let's create a file and call it episodes list.tsx. Let's put our boy react code in there and what we're going to do is create a constant variable first and that is going to take a bunch of props we haven't yet created but we'll do in the future. So one called episode, one called toggle favorite action and one called favorite. And this is going to inherit from our props argument which we'll add here and for now will be any. This of course will return an array of JSX elements. We could do it that way or we could do it this way. It's entirely up to you. They're both essentially the same thing. Okay, save this file and let's copy all of this, say from, yeah, from state onwards to about here. We want to copy all of this and paste it in our new file about here, I'd say. No. Let's get rid of this return. It's looking a bit confusing at the moment. And we are going to have a return here. So in return episodes that is passed in from the prop. And what that's going to do is map, which is correct. We haven't imported I episodes, so let's do that now. Whoops. Okay, we don't need that in this file. And this is all looking good. So we've got key episode ID, episode box. Yeah, this all looks fine. I think one small thing that I want to do, which I should which I should have done in the previous video, is add some style here. Just something really simple so that the button can be aligned to the season and episode number. So we're going to just add two things. First a display flex and then we're going to add a justify content of space between. Okay, so we seem to have an error over here and that can easily be fixed by getting rid of states. And as we are going to input favorites from our props, this should fix that. And also let's see what's going on here. We seem to have an extra curly brace. I'm gonna format the code and save the file. So now we have this, we can import it into here. Seems to be a problem with this file for some reason. Okay, I'm going to leave that for now. I don't see why it's giving me an issue. Um, what we're going to do is import the new file we've just created, but not in the same way we've done it here. We're going to import it in a different way. We're going to use React Suspense or React Lazy to be to be to correct myself to import this. So we're going to have a const variable called op episode episode list. That's going to use React Lazy. And that needs a callback function, which will be an import of our file we just created. So that'll be episode list. Okay, we'll leave that for now. I'm not actually sure what the type of this is at the moment, but I'll fix that later. And what we're going to do is create a const variable of all the props we're going to have in this component. In fact, this should actually be inside our 
inside our main function. And what that's going to have is, a, is an object with a few different things. We're going to have one called episodes, which would be state.episode. We're going to have another one called toggle fave action, which would be the same as what's already here. And we are going to have favorites. In fact, this should actually be a lot lower because we are using the favorite action. So it should be below the function we're going to use. And we can get rid of that and make use of the ES6 syntax. OK, and now let us import our episode list. I'm trying to figure out where we, ha where we had it before. I think it was inside here, if I remember correctly. We're going to import it like so. And oh, we're going to make use of our props up here, using the spread operator to open it up. So we'll have various properties inside it. OK, seems like I've stuck this inside the action, which it shouldn't be. It should be outside it. So I'll put that below. OK, so now that's visible. And what else am I missing? Forgot to close that. Okay, so we still have a few errors here. Let's see what we can do to fix that. It looks like it doesn't like the fact that I've used TSX here, so I'll change it just to TS, which will satisfy that bug. And for now, I'm not really sure about why this is causing an issue. I'm going to cheat a bit and give it a generic of any, which will fix that. I'm gonna get rid of this. This was me doing some testing to try and fix the issue, but that wasn't really necessary. Now what we're going to do here is import something called React Suspense, which will lazy load in our code. So currently we're splitting this off. When it compiles, this will be quite this will be separate. And when we run the code, it will lazy load this bit in. So if we were to save and refresh our browser now, we'd get this error because it needs a suspense fallback. So let's add that to our code. We'll put that just outside here, and we're going to call it React Suspense. Close it down here, and the fallback will be something really simple. Um, let's just say we're going to have a fallback of a div that just says loading. Okay, save that, go back to our browser. And we have an error. This is completely my fault. I haven't attended this bit yet. So this bit that I added here, I haven't really gone back to it to fix what's going on. So let's see what the issue is here. OK, it looks like I'm not passing the episodes into it. I believe I spelled episodes without an S. And when we try that, everything loads in. Now, if you refresh the page, for a split second, you will see the, the word loading before it gets the API request and the data in. So I'll try and show that to you now. But it happens so quickly. If you do see it, you've got very fast eyes. But it's up there somewhere. It happens really quickly. And that's what suspense is doing. So because the internet I'm using is quite fast, it loads very quickly. But if you had a slower internet connection, you'd actually see the word loading before that, before the content shows up. And I'm going to try to represent that in our network tab of Chrome. And I'm going to make it a fast 3G. If I refresh the page now, you will see loading, and then it loads the content. And if I make it a slower 3G connection, then you'll see it even for longer. And that's just a quick run through of how React Lazy and Suspense work. But we haven't yet addressed the issue of adding a second page to our app and a second and a bunch of links at the top. So let's do that now. Conventionally, it's for routing in React, it's convention to use something called React Router. But what we're going to use in this course is something called Reach Router. Reach Router is a bit is less widely known. It's less used. And it is mainly used 
well, we're mainly going to use it because of its accessibility. So it's made by somebody called, no, nope, that's the wrong router. This is the right one. Signed by someone called Ryan Florence, and this is the documentation for it, and you're welcome to look through it. Um, but because I've already done this before, I'm going to jump straight in and get start get coding. So let's first of all we need to install the router. So quit the, your server and do npm install reach router. Don't forget the at symbol. And that should take some time. You might get some npm audit issues. You're welcome to fix them or ignore them. I'm going to fix them out of habit. Great. Once that's done, let's start the server again. And what I'm going to do is trust that it's going to start in the background. I'm going to close this terminal. I don't know where this came from. Let's get rid of that. And in the meantime, we can add a type to this, to our props. So let's create an interface really quickly. Um, and we are going to call this episode props. So I episode props. And it's going to have these three things. Episode, which I believe is a is a is I episodes. This is, I guess, one of these things from here, without an S, sorry. But this will be an array of I episodes. And toggle favorite action. I think that'll just be a function. And then favorites will also be an array of I episodes. In order to avoid confusion, I'm going to use this format of array. And if I've used it anywhere else, uh, if I use it this way in the code, I'll probably go back and change it as I go through it. But let's keep everything consistent. OK, this is done. And I'm going to attach this onto here, see if everything works. It's giving me an issue because this is the wrong type. It's type of I action, not just a normal function. So I stick that here, and that's broken everything. Looks like it's just given given us the type here. I, I don't have to experiment. So this is what it is. I'm going to copy this and paste it in here. Fantastic. Now let's get rid of this. First of all, we're going to stick it in our interfaces. So because we're going to import it anyway, I'll just go put that there, and let's remove it from here it in our interfaces file and put the word export. Okay. And that should fix that. Now I'm trusting our server is running. Yes, and it is. I'll check the terminal to double check. Oh no it's not. Let's make sure it's probably running now. Okay. And now that reach router is installed, I'm going to add the link to our header section. So first of all, we are going to import link from reach router. It's very similar to React router, so you don't have to learn a complete new API if you've used React router before. Okay, and let's make use of link by creating two links. I've made a mistake. Okay, let's create. Let's create two links. One called header and one called favorites. Sorry, one called home and one called favorites. It's going to link to the home page, and we're going to copy hit this one here, paste it down there, and grab everything that's inside the favorites bit. Okay, and then this is going to link to a page we haven't yet because we haven't yet created called Faves. Okay, let's go ahead and create this routing. In fact, let's just check if our um, code is running and it seems to have an issue. 
Ah. Of course, I forgot to install the reach router type declaration, so let me do that now. Sometimes I forget that I'm using TypeScript. So let's kill that and install that. And that should take some time, so I'll come back to the code once this is over. Again, let's fix these security vulnerabilities. Okay. Start the server. Have the correct port, and if all goes well, it should load up and run fine with our two links here that don't currently link to anything. The URL will, will change, but the, there are no pages. So let's create those pages. Let's create two pages, one called home page .tsx, and you've guessed it, another one called fave page .tsx. In our home page, what we're going to do is grab a few things from this page. So first, let's take all of our actions. We should have two. Uh, copy that incorrectly. Okay, grab our two actions and our effect. All of them together. And let's put that in our home page after creating a simple component. We're also going to need a bunch of things like our dispatch and our interfaces. Which we will take from here and we're going to need the store file as well. So there's, there's going to be a lot of back and forth like I said before. We're moving files around so it's better that we use the react dot syntax instead of just importing everything selectively. We've got the bulk of it. We also need to import this into there. And then essentially the only thing that the last thing we're going to need from here is this stuff. Pretty much. Okay, and we're going to use a fragment to close everything off. I mean, open everything at the top. And we'll need this one as well. Not forgetting our episode lists. We don't need it here anymore. All right, looks like most of it's in there. So now what this, what our app TSX file is going to do is going to contain our header. So we want our homepage and our favorite page to have the same header. So we're going to pass them through this component and we're going to use props, children, um, Okay, and we need to add props to here, which will be any for now. We can get rid of this, this one, and all of this here. Actually, we do need state. We need to get state back, but we don't need this because we want to display the length. Okay, that should be it. Also got rid of this this batch because we don't need it either. Get rid of this console log and clean this up a tiny bit, format it with prettier. Now we're going to create a very simple routing. In our index.tsx file, let's import the two pages we created. Actually, we've only, we've only created one page, so this is this is in anticipation of the second page we're going to create. Um, to get rid of this error, let's just do that really now. C 
seems to be just fave, not faves. There we go. And that's exported. So that will fix this line of code we had here, I believe. Maybe not. There we go. Okay, so we also need to import router from reach router. Capital R, very important. And what we're going to do is encapsulate our router underneath our state provider. That's going to have our whole app inside it. And of course, our app will be the head of everything. So we're going to change the way this works. So this will be our root path. So if we go to our root path, we're going to hit the app code, but we'll also hit the home page. So it no longer need to be self-closing. Now from reach router, we also need to import something called router component props. Sorry, root component props. This will make sense a bit later. So currently, if we want to import or if we want to add a root with reach router in TypeScript, we need to make our own custom custom const variable for that to import the types. I think it's not supported yet in the router types. Sorry, in the reach router typing file. So um, this will look a bit confusing, but hopefully I'll try my best to explain it. Let's create a const variable called router page. And what that's going to do is going to have be a anonymous function, which will return will return something called props page components. Okay, this looks a bit weird. I'll make sense of this. So this is like an argument called props. Now props are the attributes that will go on the React component. So this is a prop called path. And we actually need to define a type for one prop and that's the name of the component that is going to be rooted. So we will call that uh, page component and that will be type JSX elements. And the, we're not going to just have one prop in this, in this component. We're going to have a lot of other props. So we'll have this one page component, the one type we'll specify, and we'll just say any of anything else that React provides, which will be this one. Sorry, anything else that, that Reach Reach provides. So we'll have our custom prop name, which is page component, and all the other props that we can have from Reach Router. Hope that makes sense. So we're going to make use of this router page. And we're going to make use of our page component props. Okay. And that will need a JSX element. So let's grab this element, sorry, the home page element. And we're going to use it like we're using the element. And we're going to have a path, which is a normal reach router attribute, sorry, the normal reach router prop. And that will be the default path, so the root path. Okay. We are going to do the same thing for our favorites page. But this is going to have a different path called faves path. Save that. Go to our browser. Sorry, you didn't see the Udemy stuff go to our browser and we should have two different paths here one going to favorites and one going to the home page favorites currently says test because that's what I've put here but you can put anything you want okay now let's populate our favorites page to show the favorites we select from our home page okay we're back and our aim now is to populate the favorites page so that it can display favorites onto our app. But before we do that, what I want to do is split our actions into separate file because I know both the home page and the favorite page is going to use the action or is going to use specifically the toggle favorite action. So let's go into our source folder and create a new file called actions.ts. I don't think there's any JSX inside these actions, so it should be fine just to label it TS. And now let's copy all of our actions 
here and paste it inside this file. Of course, we're going to need to export both of these constant variables, or sorry, constant functions. And then after we do that, we're going to need a few more attributes other than the episode. Sorry, a few more arguments. So as you can see, this, this batch is necessary. So let's pass that in as an argument. And that hasn't got a type at the moment. I think by default it's, it's a specific type. I'll come back to it later, but we'll do any for now. And also this will need a dispatch as well as the state. So we're going to pass the state into here. I believe state is I state, which we haven't passed into it yet. And also dispatch, which for now we'll leave as any, but we'll come back to it. Okay, so we're going to import these um, interfaces. We'll just grab them from here. We don't have one for this one. And let's have a look. I'm going to see if I state is actually what it's called. Yep, it's called I state. So back to our actions file. Grab that from here. And that should have everything apart from. OK, this is quite odd. I think I episode is missing a bunch of extra, bunch of extra attributes. So let's see what's going on there. OK. By the way, this favorite also has to be episode. So we'll do that now while we're here. And let's see what's going on with our actions file. OK, so for now, let's just give it any. We'll come back to that later. I'm not sure why it's giving me that error. So that will fix that. And then we are going to get rid of all our actions inside here and import them from our actions file we just created. OK, as you can see, it's missing these. So we're going to get rid of this because we're not using them anymore and import them from our file, which we're going to do like so. If I can spell. OK, and it's missing some arguments. So I believe the dispatch we can pass in through here. I think that's, that's all it needs. For the fetch data and for the toggle, the toggle action, I think it needs a lot more than that, so let's see what we can do. Turns out the reason this is causing an error is because I forgot to change my interface file. So as you can see here, it's expecting just one um, just one argument, which is episode, but I've actually changed it to take three. So let's amend that now. States, which I believe is I state and also dispatch, which is any, because we don't know what it is just yet. When we come back to our home page, we should see that error is gone. Now, the reason that this is working, which is essentially that without me passing arguments into the function, is because without the curly brackets, all I'm doing is just passing the function from here into the episode list file. So it was just a, a simple pass. So I can write it like this, and I don't need to pass any arguments into it. So the real, the real change will happen inside the episode list file, which is where I need to add in the state and the dispatch. So what I'm going to do in the home page is add another prop called state. And I'm going to pass these two constants into there. And as you can see, I've got an error because my i Episode props needs to be updated with these two things. So let's do that here. We are going to add state, and we're going to have two um, two things in our object. One is state, which is I state, and the other one is dispatch, which is still any because I don't know what type that is at the moment. So that should fix this over here. I don't know what was going on previously, but I just rewrote the type that was here in exactly the same way that it was before, and the error that I had here disappeared. So 
yeah, sometimes that's all it takes and the code works fine. Okay, so now that we've done this, we can go into our episode list and we have if you we have one more prop to import, which is state. And here what we can do is get our state. Um, do you know what? Let's further deconstruct the state here. And um, let's grab whoops. Let's grab our state and get our dispatch from there. And I think it's giving issues because I've named it twice, which is probably my fault, but but we'll leave it for now. I think the best thing to do is maybe to rename this to store. Change that here. Okay, that's fixed. And we'll do that here as well. And that should probably fix this issue we're having here. And now what we can do is add our state into here as an argument and our dispatch. Fantastic. All right, now we can go ahead and start working on our favorites page. So before we do that, let's check if our code actually works as it did before. Refresh, content loads, jump to our favorites, has a test, jump to our home, has our content, we can favorite things and there seems to be an error. Dispatch is not a function. Okay, what have I done here? So dispatch has passed through and we are, let's have a look at how this works. All right, the eagle eyed amongst you would have noticed I've spelt dispatch wrong. So now if we save that and go back to our code, if we click on favorite and favorite, that all works fine. Okay, now let's finally go on to add some content into this section, so instead of leaving it as test. What we're going to do will be very similar to this page, apart from the fact that it will have a few less things. So it's go we're gonna need to grab our episodes, I'll lazy load that in, like so. We are going to need to grab our store. And we are going to, of course, grab our dispatch of our store with our state. Put it down here somewhere. And we are going to need a props similar to what we have in our homepage file. And we are going to return suspense. Let's get rid of this actually, we don't need it anymore. Um, is it going to auto close for me? Yes, it is. And we are going to need a div with a class name of episode layout. And we are going to finally get our episode list component with its relevant props. Okay, let's import that because we don't have it imported. We do have it imported, sorry, that's my fault. <coughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to give you the opportunity to fill in what will go inside here to populate the favorites page. I highly recommend, as usual, you pause the video, give it some thought, and once you're done, come back and we'll go through the solution together. Okay. So I'm going through the solution now, and we're going to have an object of episode, episodes, <coughs> which will grab states, favorites, instead of episodes. We are going to take, as usual, toggle, toggle favorite action. We don't need the we don't need the fetch action. And for favorites, it will be favorites as well. Hopefully you figure that out. Basically what this is doing is just looping over the favorites. And if we click on 
unfave it, it will do a loop and realize that there's one missing, so it will get rid of it. Now, as you mentioned before, our toggle nav needs a bit more than than just the favorites. So we're going to grab a store and give it state and dispatch so that our toggle nav function can have access to it. Let's format the page of prettier. And before we go, let's grab the interface that this needs. And I think it's I episode props. So we'll grab that from here. Put this there. And this whole function needs to return a JSX element. Let's see if that worked. Let's go back to our page. Add a few favorites in. Go to our favorites, and they're here. And we can unfavorite them, and they'll disappear. Brilliant. So as you've seen, we have created a very simple app for favoriting Rick and Morty episodes. It uses context and use reducer. So it uses two kind of non-standard standard hooks to replicate Redux. The app has a shared store, which is inside here. If I can locate it, where is the store for, there we go. Has a shared store, which is created with context and the actions are triggered with the um, reducer, sorry, the state is changed with the reducer. As you can see here, the state isn't mutated. It's always a clone of the state that gets returned, not the actual state itself. So I hope this diagram makes more sense. Um, clicking on this button triggers the action. In fact, triggers the add favorite action. Add favorite then goes to the reducer, as you can see here updates the store and that is read by the component in our case which is the home page and it loops over the episodes fantastic let's go through and polish our code a bit more all right let's see what we can do to clean up our code first off i did promise we can get rid of this type any so this type is actually element and that will fix that but one clever thing we can do here is we can use some code destructuring to just grab the children property instead of grabbing the props. That way I can just show children without the props and it's still type element. Format with prettier and looks a bit nicer. My mistake, this shouldn't be element, but instead JSX element children attribute save and our app should be running fine now let's go to our interfaces and let's deal with this dispatch so it turns out dispatch is quite a complicated one so we're going to create a type for it and that type will be called dispatch and that will borrow from react dispatch and we'll have a uh, generic of by action like so and I think do we need to import react I guess we don't it's not giving us any error so I can put this here save that and fingers crossed everything works fine now because we've exported it we can borrow it in other files so this doesn't need a dispatch to my knowledge but I think this needs it no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, OK, I guess it's only used in one place. OK, and what else do we want to change? One thing we could change is this payload over here. So this payload is, judging by the store, it looks like it's a an array of i episodes. So we can do that now. Okay, that works. So as you can see, everything in our interface has a type. There are no any's in our interface, which is great.
Okay, I'm gonna cheat for now and just leave it like that. And I did promise we'd come back later and fix some of these things, but I've done some research and found out there aren't really any real ways to give certain things types. Like, for example, this lazy that we use quite often, I haven't found a proper type for it. So maybe in a few days, a few weeks time, I might come back to the video and make some amendments. But for now, we're gonna leave the project there. We've done as much as we can in terms of assigning types to, to variables and functions and methods. And I think this is a good place to leave the project. Of course, you're more than welcome to do your own research, but in my opinion, this is a very robust app in terms of type checking and it doesn't really need anything else. So congratulations for getting to the end of the course. You should know how to use TypeScript in a React project by installing it from scratch with Webpack and Babel or installing it in Create React app, which is quicker, but takes a bit longer to load up. You should also know how to use TypeScript with React hooks, especially the use context hook and the use reducer hook. And you should know how to essentially recreate Redux in one of your projects, thus having one less dependency. I hope you found this useful. And once again, as you've noticed, this course is completely free on Udemy. If you do want to support me, however, you can do, do that in various ways. You can either follow me on Twitter, check out my YouTube channel and subscribe to it. You can become a patron for continuous support. Or if you want to support me one off, you could use coffee just to give me a small amount of money. Like I said in the description, every little matters. And if you don't want to support me financially, that's absolutely fine. Supporting me via YouTube or Twitter or just saying thank you for the course in Udemy is more than enough. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or use the Udemy messaging system. With that said, thank you so much for learning from this course and I hope to see you in a future video.